Bitcoin und Co. Der Podcast über Kryptowährungen, Blockchain-Anwendungen und das digitale Leben. Mit Buchautorin und Bitcoin-Expertin Anita Posch. Hallo Professor Forgo. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me and to record this podcast. We met at the cryptocurrency conference recently, where you were one of the speakers and your topic was about blockchain and data protection. Mm -hmm. It was a very enjoyable talk. Most talks by lawyers are very boring and difficult to understand for non-lawyers, but I liked yours uh, very much. And um, that's also the, the time when I got interested in your work. Mm -hmm. um, since 2017, when I got that right, you are the head of the Department of Innovation and Di Digitalization in Law at the University of Vienna in uh, Austria. Yes. Please, um, hello, hello and mm -hmm. thank you. Um, please tell us a little bit about your personal story and how did you get interested in law? And when mm -hmm. did this connection uh, and um, um, working together with uh, IT start? How many hours do I have? <laughs> <laughs> well, so very briefly, um, uh, I mean, I, I, I studied law in uh, between 1986 and 1990, and I was in particular interested already then uh, by the question in how far uh, technology, no, in how far, uh, how it works that humans use a general and abstract law to decide a specific case which is not really mentioned in the law. So the relationship between the, the individual case and the abstract law was always of interest to me. And I started very early already in the 90s to, to think and to write about in how far this, this way of, of using the law for, for a specific case could be substituted by machines and by algorithms and by computers. And therefore, uh, I'm one of the of the dinosaurs of this uh, whole field because I, I really started when the internet was not really a common common phenomenon yet, and uh, and and I was not so much uh, interested in in the coding parts, although although that was also fascinating, but more in the in the social and philosophical implications uh, that would have. That was one starting point, and the other starting point which is quite connected to the first one was, as I was interested in IT, I was one of the very few in the 90s who were able to work with this a little bit. And I was, I spent a lot of my time in the early phases of my career in connecting cables and, 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 and bringing printers on the internet, etc., and bringing the law school on the internet and all those practical things. And that, that, that merged in a way then later during my career. And then I spent 15 or 18 years in Germany working on this, not only in a law department, but also in a computer science department. Um, and then I came back again, uh, being by training a lawyer, but always a lawyer interested in information technology and, 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 and social and theoretical implications of, of information technology for law. The department was founded in... 2017? Yes, that's true. Is this not a bit late or has this well, work been already done somewhere <laughs> well, else know, in Austria? Well, I mean, uh, a department is founded at the law school of the University of Vienna every 40 years or so. Okay. So it's, I don't think that another one was founded in my lifetime apart from the one for uh, financial law, Finanzrecht. Uh, that, is, that is the only one I'm aware of in my lifetime that was founded. So it's a very, very rare phenomenon. Um, and uh, on the one hand, of course, it's late. On the other hand, it's early. Other schools come later. I do not even have something like this yet. Mm -hmm. And it's also uh, not the case that nobody has thought about this before 2017 uh, in this law school, but it's in a more structured way now that people work together and cooperate together. And on the same, on, and at the same time, you always need to be a little bit cautious when such things are established because there's always a little bit of a hype in it as well and everybody's talking about innovation and digitalization and all that fancy words at the moment so it's not necessarily per se a good sign if something is established it you you need to put some structure and some substance to it um, and therefore i wouldn't say that it's late it's uh It's 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 not. I mean, it's not. We are not early birds here, but we. I think it's uh, it's justifiable that that this was founded in 2017 only, and not in 2010 or in 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was your main working part here in the last uh, months, last year? 
building up everything. So when I came here, I, not even the name was clear, and and there was no no nothing ready. So I I was uh, I I was employee number one, and the first thing that I did was that I organized my computer and my phone and my my table and etc. And and since then I have been working on, on on trying to set this up, and I think it's a twenty year exercise, and I'm in year two now. So let's see where this will end. Okay. <laughs> um, what do you say are the important skills that law students of today need to have or to know in these times? In in particular, Actually, uh, I, I think uh, that's uh, I mean that's a very common question, and I honestly I don't know. There are so different fields of the law. Uh, yeah. I, I, th I mean, that's still one of the huge advantages of studying law, that it still allows you so very, very different ways of making a living out of what you know. That I would not, I would not strongly suggest that the typical law student needs to have this or that uh, skill. Uh, however, I think one of the things I, I learned is the most important. The most important skill that you need is that you need to have another interest and not only the law when you want to work in an area and have an impact. So, and IT obviously would be one of the areas where it's relatively easy to have an interest in, at least for me, mm -hmm. but it's not the only one. But I, I mean, if, if people are interested in, in how our society changes, and many lawyers are interested in this, Then having some interest in 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 information technology is certainly an asset. Um, coming back to the topic of blockchains, can you please elaborate on the implications of data privacy and blockchains? What um, do developers and businesses need to understand when they are building a blockchain product? So that's a very tough question. Uh, honestly, I don't know the answer. <laughs> so the first answer I would have is. Uh, take it serious. I mean, uh, law is a, is a law, and in particular, data protection law can be a weapon of mass destruction if you don't you, if you don't know what you're doing. So you should take it serious, but at the same time, you should not take it too serious in the sense that you are panicking about about uh, data protection law. Data protection law is one important area of the law when it comes to blockchain. Uh, but it it should be, in principle at least, if you're working as a startup and you're establishing something, uh, be an an obstacle that will not kill you. So my, my major suggestion would be try to find someone in your team, if you are a startup, try to find someone in your team who has a legal background, not necessarily as a qualified lawyer, because qualified lawyers tend to be very expensive. And you probably don't want to afford that at the beginning. But there are plenty of bright law students who have already some kind of basic skills and, and the interest. And that would be somebody I would look for. And it's quite, I mean, if you're looking for those people, you will also find them. And to answer your question, what, what data protection law can, or where it can be a problem. So the first thing is after GDPR, which is this huge piece of legislation that made its way through Europe in the last month and is still and is now applicable since May 2018. One of the one of the many things GDPR brings is that they have huge fines defined there. So in, in theory up to 20 million euro fine. Everybody is upset about that huge sum. Never ever a startup will be confronted with such a sum. But it's more serious than it was before. And, and data protection authorities have more power than they have before and it's more in the general interest and therefore what what you should have a look into if you if you were a startup and if you have your law students taking care of the issues would be in how far your business model is in line at least with the fundamental principles of gdpr which are mentioned in particular in article 5 so if you have only 20 seconds of time or two minutes of time to invest into gdpr then read article 5 That's the list of principles that need to be met when it comes to the processing of personal data in Europe. Okay, so you say take a look at the business model first, what yes. you want to do with a blockchain and yes. how it interferes with the article 25. Five. Five, 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 in particular five. Five, yeah. Five, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is that is a good first thing, right? If you if you think that you can be more or less compliant with Article Five. 
which is already challenging because there are things in there like purpose binding principle, which means that data needs to be processed for a given purpose. You may not collect first and then think about the purpose. Or the principle or principle of data minimization, meaning you should not collect data that you don't need for your purpose and so on. So if you have if you have read this and if you think that you are fine with Article 5, the next two minutes that if you still have two minutes that I would invest would be into the rights of the data subject. So data subject, that's the person whose data is processed, has a given list of rights, the right to withdraw consent, the right to be informed, the right not to be subject of a decision that is only taken by the algorithm, etc. Um, and and uh, and these rights, which come mainly in Articles uh, 15 and ongoing up to 22, approximately, uh, that would be the ones that I would have a look into in in uh, as well. And but as I said, take it serious, but don't don't let your idea be killed because you have the feeling that you don't understand what there is in the law and it is so complex that you don't follow it. Blah 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 blah. Not true. You need somebody who is skilled in reading this. And, and he or she will be able to transpose this in a way that you can survive with. As I understand it, um, you should look to not put personal data on the blockchain because it's immutable. Yes. But actually, uh, the, the data is hashed. Yes. Oh, and so I um, don't quite understand where the problem is. <laughs> Because I can, if, if I know the data, I can uh, match it with the hash and then I, I, I have a, a link back. Yes. Is this the reason? I don't know whether I get the question, but yeah. I think I have an answer to okay. <laughs> another question or to that question, yeah. possibly. Yeah. So help me if it's wrong what I'm saying for your question, but I, I will try. Give me a first try. So the, uh, there is a very fundamental distinction in data protection law. It's, so this is the zero line of data protection law, which is, is it personal or not? If data is to be seen personal, then the whole regime of data protection applies. If it's not personal, no data protection rule applies. Whether it's personal or not is not identical with whether there is a name on the data or something similar. So there doesn't need to be a direct identifier in order to make data identifiable in the sense of the law. It is sufficient if it is possible with reasonable means to re-identify a person. And this is the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So if something is on the blockchain, most probably it's there in a pseudonymous format, meaning mm -hmm. there is not my name on the data, but there is a hash coming with the data. And if somebody had the means and the time and the willingness, he or she would be able to re-identify that I was the person who signed that originally. And that means that the data would be personal. That does not necessarily mean that everything is illegal. So you may process personal data, of course, but it means that you are within the regime of data protection law. Very, very many blockchain scenarios I know are within the regime of data protection law. It's very mm -hmm. rare that you are outside because the more information there is outside, the more uh, probable it is that somebody will be able to re-identify you and that will be sufficient. Okay. So Bitcoin is, of course, then... Bitcoin is in... in, in uh, many people believe that Bitcoin is processing uh, personal information and is within the scope of data protection law, therefore. Because you, you could track back if you, you buy back an index indeed, exchange. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. they are, I mean, if you, if you invest real money into Bitcoins, many of those uh, traders take a lot of time and invest a lot of effort to be able to identify you, right? So it's, it's very, very identifiable in many cases. And therefore, as it's identifiable at the source, it remains identifiable until the very end. Yes, yes. So actually, that's what consumers need to know about uh, cryptocurrencies if they use them. Well, I think, I mean, it's something, I mean, that is another question. I mean, that's more now a question about what, what to do or not to do with cryptocurrencies, mm -hmm. using it in, 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 because you are of the opinion that you may not be trapped is not really a good idea because law enforcement will certainly, I mean, if you do something illegal, uh, law enforcement will certainly try to identify you. And there are examples where they were, of course, able to re-identify people.
Eine kurze Einschaltung unseres Sponsors, der Firma Coinfinity. Vielen Dank für Ihr Verständnis. Es geht in Kürze weiter. Dieser Podcast wird freundlicherweise unterstützt von Coinfinity, einem österreichischen Bitcoin-Broker und Kompetenzzentrum für Blockchain-Lösungen. Kaufen Sie Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin und Dash über die Website von Coinfinity oder auch in jeder österreichischen Trafik über das Gutscheinprodukt Bitcoin Bohn. Coinfinity bietet auch die sogenannte Bitcoin-Wertschrift an. Physische Bitcoins, die eine langfristige und sichere Aufbewahrung ermöglichen. Weiters berät Coinfinity Unternehmen bei der Nutzung von Kryptowährungen und der technischen Abwicklung von ICOs. Kundenberatung wird bei Coinfinity großgeschrieben. Rufen Sie einfach an, kommen Sie im Office in Graz vorbei oder besuchen Sie Coinfinity unter www.coinfinity.co. I found a statement from you on Twitter which says uh, trust in technology, not in the law. Yes. Or in another version, don't put your trust in the law and invest in tech. What did you mean by that? Well, I, th I mean, Because that's very, I mean, it's a little bit cynical, but it's also after many years of experience in the area. Law is always late when it comes to technological developments. And therefore, legal means are often under the risk of not really fitting uh, the problem. And that is true for many uh, technological developments, including blockchain. So if you simply read uh, GDPR and you read that there should be a right to get your data deleted, you will see quite quickly that that is not really, I mean, that is theory, but it's not really practical on, on, on the average blockchain. And, and that is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a challenge then, a constant challenge to try to adapt those outdated legal instruments on, on new and newly approaching phenomena. And, and many lawyers tend to try to make the law fit in the sense that they interpret and then they ask for new laws and then the politicians start and invent the wheel, reinvent the wheel. Um, and I don't think that that works very well in very many areas. And I think lawyers need to be uh, much more uh, reluctant in asking for new laws and should listen a little bit more to the technicians developing technical solutions that might be fit for purpose. So we are, should be moving more into an interdisciplinary working... Yeah. Interdisciplinarity is always very popular and every, every academic who wants to be fancy asks for interdisciplinarity and it's very hard to live because mm -hmm. you need to be quite good in your own field and then you still need to have some time to understand what the other people are thinking about and do not believe that they think the same way just because they use the same words. It's not true. So it's, it's a constant challenge to try to not only stay on track in your own field but also have enough expertise to be able to understand what the other fields are doing and that's very challenging. You need many people for this. It's not a one-person effort. Um, talking about blockchains, um, I heard another lawyer predict that there might be nation-state blockchains uh, where verdicts are published or decisions can be changed by the authorities, um, which actually contradicts the characteristics of a blockchain. What's the future? What might there be for governmental or... Actually, I don't know. If I knew it, I yeah. would do something. I mean, I do, the only thing I know is I don't trust anybody predicting the future. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I don't want to predict the future. I just want to mention that I don't think that it would be a very natural development of, of this if national states survived in the sense that we know them at the moment. And if then there would be some nationwide blockchain in Austria and another one in Afghanistan and the third one in wherever, in Germany or South Africa. I don't think that there is any technological sense behind this. And, 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 and the social sense of nation states and of uh, power coming with nation states is already eroding now. So we already see in many areas where the internet is really, really dominant that the nation state no longer really gives you the protection or, or the weapons you might ask for if you were a victim. Um, and I don't, and therefore I don't think that it will be, I don't think that it will be a nation A blockchain versus a nation B blockchain infrastructure. I think the more, the more plausible scenario would be 
that the importance of nation states per se is disappearing or at least decreasing. And that is something which is obviously interesting because uh, the protection that comes with a nation state has something to do with democracy and the rule of law and, and, and discourse and, and protection of minorities and all those boring details, which are obviously not boring, but important. And I find it very challenging to think about how this could, can be, how this, these principles can survive uh, without nation state protection. Mm. I mean, at the moment in many countries, also here, Uh, it goes into a very radical, like almost totalitarian feeling uh, direction. Um, is this because of the loose uh, that people have lost their trust? You mean of people who, who develop blockchain infrastructures? No, or? Um, it was more generally speaking. Yeah. Because you said you think that the nation state will lose its power or its... Uh, um, But that's already happening now. I think it's yeah. not that that's, that's not coming with blockchain. No. I mean, blockchain is just a new, next step with this. It's, it comes. It came with the internet, and when you go back to the to the first reactions of how how the political system reacted on on the internet and how early adopters of the internet reacted on how nation states wanted to get this back to normal. So we are now in the early 90s somewhere. You, I think that is a very interesting. There are very interesting parallels in this debate then. Um, and since then, uh, nation states have constantly faced issues of not really being able to guarantee compliance with their nation, national rules. It starts with uh, copyright and it ends with data protection and child pornography is something every politician in the discussion has named as a problem since, I don't know, 1993 or so. Every year I'd read that somewhere. Or, or this famous German saying, uh, was recht ist, muss auch im Internet recht sein. So the law also needs to be applied on the Internet. That is nothing new. It's just, just replace Internet by blockchain and you are in the same debate again. Yeah, but it doesn't work. What's the idea of how can that work out? I think it's a, that is a very tough question again. I think one of them is... Ne It's, it's probably not a good idea to try to solve this on a national level. So the, the more international you are, the more, uh, the higher your chances are that that has some impact. So probably it's a good idea to try to do things at least in Europe on a European level. And it's probably one of the reasons why so much European law uh, has been made in the last 15 or 20 years in the area, because nation, nation states are too small and they are too different. So that would be one answer, get international. The second answer would be work on a really interdisciplinary level, meaning try to understand as much as you can from the technology and try to convince people who do the technology that law is not boring. I mean, it is boring for many of them, but it, but it is a boring instrument for, uh, for the preservation of fundamental values and fundamental protection. Uh, also uh, fundamental democratical principles we have in our Western societies and, and try to convince that these principles should survive uh, because the, uh, the alternative would be a world that is much less uh, friendly than the one that we see at the moment. And don't believe that everything that is written in the law as illegal will not happen. It will happen in any case. And then, I mean, people do not follow the law if it's Uh, cheap enough not to do so, and uh, and and therefore simply by putting something into law does not solve the problem. Hmm. Uh, how do you personally see the future of alternative private monies like Bitcoin, for instance? It's a very it's an easy way to move money across countries, mm. to be international, to mm. to um, get off the own uh, nation state money system. Um, what is your personal take on it? I don't know. I, uh, so the first point I would like to make is Bitcoin is, in my view, a rather bad example because there's so much volatility in the market. And, and therefore, Bitcoin to, to use Bitcoin as a currency for day-to-day -day payments is not really a good choice for the average consumer as long as there is so much volatility in the market. 
I don't know whether this volatility problem is because the market is so small, this is what some people argue, or whether it's an intrinsic problem of the whole system. As long as the volatility problem is not solved, I don't think that the average end user will start to use Bitcoin as a daily instrument for daily payments. Um, and at the same time, also more traditional payment systems on the internet are rather convenient and have become quite convenient and will probably become more convenient due to the pressure coming from alternative payment systems. So I'd, my personal prognosis would be an average consumer in an average internet relation to somebody on the market will not use Bitcoin or similar currencies in the near future as an alternative to his credit card or PayPal account or his, just his normal account. On the other hand, the, the huge potential the whole system has, as you and all, all the listeners certainly know, is that the banks might no longer be needed. And that is something which has a potential that is very interesting. So this, this idea of having a network, a payment network without trustees, everybody needs to trust into, that is something which is really interesting. But that is, I mean, I'm not talking about three years or five years. I'm talking probably about 20, 30, 20 years here. And I'm not talking about the average consumer trying to buy something on Amazon for whom that might be interesting. But that is, that is certainly... Uh, a very, very powerful concept going much beyond just payment. That is, that is why blockchain is so interesting. It's not just about payment. It's about literally everything where you need a trustee and states are very good in providing trustees. Um, and, and that is why, why my interest at the moment is very much into in how far the whole ecosystem can be replaced by blockchain technologies no longer needing trustees. What do you think? Um, which things could a blockchain in 10 or 20 years replace um, in terms of governmental or state um, things? Yeah, certificates or, so, yeah, yeah. or uh, statements. Well, everything where, I mean, everything, if you, if you go, if you apply for a passport today or if you go somewhere and, 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 and establish a company, and the state gives you a certificate and a stamp or something, and you pay for this, the reason why you need to go there is because the state guarantees that what you're doing is trustworthy, that somebody was there, somebody checked who you are, somebody checked whether you have the money, somebody checked whether this is a good business idea, I mean, a legal business idea. And all these all these uh, no long, are no longer needed if, if there is a, a system of trust out there working without trustees. So everything where the state comes in as an authority for trust, uh, that is under risk, I would say. And that's a lot. But how can this um, offline and online world or environments be connected? Yeah, because um, I mean, I as a person, I'm not digital and I'm not on the blockchain. So how can this be connected? Yeah, you could receive easily. I mean, first, uh, your offline identity is already now fading away. I mean, more and more of our daily life is no longer offline. It just We just believe that it's offline, but it's, I mean, your way to come here is certainly tracked and by by your mobile device and by video cameras around and blah, blah. So I don't, I don't want to bore you with this, no. but you know, but you certainly know this. So first it's fading away. The offline world is fading away. Uh, and second, of course, there needs to be a connection between an identity a person and 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 what he or she is doing on the internet, but uh, at the moment this is mainly. I mean, if you look into traditional legal concept, this is done by certification authorities. The certification authority is nothing but a trustee, uh, and the only thing they do is that they give you <laughs> an electronic stamp saying this is the person X or the person Y. And that can very easily be replaced by an infrastructure without trustees using blockchain. Hmm. Do you have um, any recommendations on um, the development of law in digitalization for people who have, a, let's say, are not specialists in law? So you mean what to read or, yeah, yeah. or what to, to watch? Well, yeah, what do you uh, read or what to watch? Okay, so uh, of course I do. Uh, so the first, the Bible, uh, I would call it, 
that I would read is uh, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, Cyberspace, which is a book that was written by an, an American academic in the late 90s. Uh, his name is Lawrence Lessig. Uh, Lawrence Lessig is inter alia the founder of Creative Commons. Uh, and that is a very influential book because it, it comes from the 90s. And the, uh, the basic idea of the book is that uh, our life in cyberspace, as it was called then, is not only regulated by the law, but it's also regulated by the technological infrastructure and that we should have a closer look into the relationship between the traditional law and, and this new law, this technology as law, uh, as he argues. So that would be... That would be my theoretical Bible, I will call it. It's a very influential book, and it's a very well-written book, and, and still with a lot of very good points on it. Um, then, of course, uh, the second Bible that I would call would be the founding document on Bitcoin as an infrastructure, 10 years now Ten that years it was today, published yeah. today. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that would be, of course, that is also very, very interesting from a legal perspective because it's easily understandable um, and it has a lot of legal implications in it. It even mentions privacy in its abstract already. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the second thing. And then on a mere, on a more uh, daily level, what I would closely monitor would be, uh, would be some blogs uh, or, or podcasts that I personally listen to. Logbuch uh, Netzpolitik uh, for the German speakers would be one. Strategy would be another one. That's an, uh, an English speaking blog on, and podcast on, on, uh, on developments on the market. Um, and possibly for the German speakers again, uh, a German one which is called Lage der Nation, which is also on, on this uh, relationship between law, technology and, and the state. Okay, thanks. Great. I will uh, link to these uh, books and Great. podcasts in the show notes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Are thank you, you going for a run? Today as well? Um, no, you're not a, today. You're yeah. a runner. Sometimes I am. A very bad one, but a very, very... <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm dedicated to it sometimes. No, not today. No. Okay. <laughs> Are you going for a run? Are you a no, runner No, not today. <laughs> I'm, I'm a cyclist more than a okay. runner. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. But not today. But okay, yeah. okay. But cycling is quite similar to running. It's the yeah. repetitive motion, right? right yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. also you get into this meditative Yeah, yeah, uh, indeed. Phase, That's what you're looking is, for, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> indeed, me too, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you very thank much. You and bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. It was my pleasure. Hat es Ihnen gefallen? Dann teilen Sie bitte den Podcast auf Facebook, Twitter oder LinkedIn. Wenn Sie Fragen zu diesem Podcast haben, hinterlassen Sie einen Kommentar auf der Podcast-Webseite unter anitaposch.com schrägstrich podcast. Wollen Sie mehr über Bitcoin und Blockchains wissen, dann lesen Sie mein Buch oder besuchen Sie eines meiner Online-Seminare, bei denen ich Ihre Fragen auch direkt beantworte. Infos dazu finden Sie auf meiner Webseite unter anitaposch.com-akademie. Das war die heutige Ausgabe von Bitcoin und Co. Idee und Inhalte von Anita Posch, Schnitt von Katrin Eidenhammer. Musik